Good to be in the Lord's house. And Lord, we just pray that you will bless this time together in your presence and speak to us through your word, we pray. And let us, Lord, fulfill the word that you have for us even this night. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do things a little bit different tonight because we're going to preach a regular message because I won't be here for a couple weeks. Then we'll have communion, and then you can pray for Brother Swarup and myself as we're leaving tomorrow for India. And also pray for my wife, Jane, in our absence. Appreciate that. Well, this evening, we're going to consider the truth of the 11th hour workers or laborers in the vineyard as portrayed Matthew chapter 20. It's a message that we have heard before, but we're actually getting closer to the time of the fulfillment of the 11th hour workers. We're definitely coming into the 11th hour spiritually. The harvest is ripening. The harvest is over at midnight, but there's still the 11th hour work that has to be done. In fact, the greatest part of the harvest is going to be done in the 11th hour, in the last hour. The earth is ripe. It's interesting, uh, I put this together a couple weeks ago and um, didn't realize that before I spoke this, I would be working in the vineyard. Because yesterday, the day before yesterday, Pastor Swarup and myself were out in the vineyard crushing grapes. Um, have to get that job done before we, we leave. So it kind of fits into the scenario here. But to fully appreciate the parable of the 11th hour workers, chapter 20, you have to back up into chapter 19, get the full sense. And as you know that in the beginning there was no demarcation between chapters. But uh, the last verse here, um, actually verse 30, it says, this is Matthew 19, 30, but many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So that last verse is the premise for the continuation of chapter 20, and Jesus is going to expound upon the thought of the first being last and the last becoming first. And so we're continuing in chapter 20 and a few verses here, um, beginning in verse 1, Matthew 20, beginning in verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard, and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Of course, a penny at the time was a day's wage, so it doesn't equate with today's penny. Anyway. In verse 3, he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And so we have to observe the fact that these laborers are being sent. They're called into the work. They're not going at their own charge. They're being sent into the work. They're commissioned. And so there's a definite call here. We can't say that um, God wasn't going to use these laborers. But going on in verse 6, and about the eleventh hour, he went out. And found others standing idle, and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the harvest saith unto the steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. 
And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Verse 10, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the goodman of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong, didst thou? Not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that is thine, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. There's a number of things you can glean from this parable. Some might propound on the magnanimity of the vineyard owner, the generosity of the vineyard owner, owner of the vineyard. Some might interpret this to mean that in heaven it's a utopia and everybody's going to share and share alike. And some might exegete the bad attitude of some of the earlier laborers here. Um, some obviously thought that the Lord was unfair because they had worked all day and, of course, the others got exactly what they received. And uh, I murmured against the good men of the house. Some might pick up the thought of wage prearrangement they had agreed for a certain price, right? The last group didn't, but uh, the rest of them did. So there's many different observations that you can glean from this parable. And actually, I can identify with some of this myself because yeah, I was a farmer. And I remember during crucial times, hay season, that my brother Paul and I, we got very small little wage from the person we worked for. Uh, at the end of the week, we started at 5 o'clock in the morning and we worked till dark. And then our boss would go down and hire some of these high school fellows with the jackets, uh, the big name letter on the jacket. They worked for an afternoon and they would get probably as much as we got for the whole week. And uh, they got paid right there on the spot. And they were about shot, too, after they worked for about four hours. We were working from dawn to dusk. So I think in our case, the, the vineyard owner was not fair, but uh, that's not the case here. But anyway, many observations you can pick up from this parable. But as we said, the interpretation to the parable comes from the last verse in chapter 19. The first shall be last, last shall be first, and also the last verse of the parable. Uh, and Jesus said, many are called, and few are chosen. So, um, those who have seemingly borne the brunt of the battle are getting what those who came in last got. Uh, several truths I want to bring out here. Firstly, uh, those who were hired last were chosen vessels. Many are called, few are chosen. And so those who went out in the last group, in the final thrust, were chosen. They weren't just ordinary workers. And they were rewarded first. And this tells us that in the final harvest, God is going to raise up people, not just ordinary people, but these are people that have been prepared and that are going to do the work. They're going to have the right message. Okay? Those who come in at the last are chosen. And I tell you what, when you take a look at the condition of the church world today, you can understand why 
those who come in last have to be prepared, have to have the word, have to have the message, because the church world today is, how shall we say, it's a mess, to say the least. So they're the chosen ones who come in the last. God has called many over the generations, um, and they've done many things. But I believe God is saving the best for the last, best wine for the last. And those who come in at the very end are, are the chosen. When you consider some of those who have worked over the generations, um, many of them laid foundations that weren't really sound. Um, they had flaws. They promoted teachings that were perhaps tainted. Teachings on election, right, Jeremy? Um, or communion, or the Godhead, or the end times. And I think that is the reason why God is spending a lot of time preparing those who are going to work in the final thrust. The harvest is very great, and this is going to be the biggest harvest at the end. The earth is ripe, both of the good and the evil. But those who are truly chosen have come through the furnace of affliction. They've suffered to get the message right. Did you ever suffer to get the message right? I have. I remember walking the road and just kind of punishing myself for things that I had said and done. and um, Took a certain suffering to get things straight in my own life. We have to be straight if we're going to get others straight, right? So those who come in last have been dealt with the most, and I believe that they will do the greater works. I was commissioned back some years ago to write a book on church history. Pastor Bailey commissioned me, asked me to write the book. He said the church history was too depressing, so he asked me to do it. Uh, I guess it's not because I'm the depressed type. I don't know. Although, anyway, he commissioned me to write this book. And um, there were generations that produced very lean harvest. Just enough kind of to have enough seed corn to carry on to the next generation. Um, then there were other generations that had bumper crop, so to speak, had vintage crop. Um, but God always preserved a handful that had the true message. There was always a handful in every generation that God preserved to continue on the true message. It had a handful of the original stock. There were times in history when things were pretty bleak, spiritually, dark ages, but God preserved some during those times to continue the church. God always had a few Caleb's and Joshua's. Thank God for men like Pastor Bailey. If I think if there hadn't been somebody like Pastor Bailey, there wouldn't be a church here anyway. But every generation produced a certain fruit of some kind. I think the generation of the 60s, I mean, that was an evil generation. I, we're still seeing the, the fruit of that generation. But then revival came at the end of that period of time, end of the 60s. And so we saw some very good fruit come out of that as well. I, I'm kind of chopping through my notes here because I had a lot more than you want to hear tonight. Is that all right? But God always has the true witness in every generation. Maybe uh, very small. God sends a rain to every generation. Sometimes it's very light, but it keeps the crop growing. <laughs> um, in Acts 14, keeps the church alive. There has to be a sprinkling in every generation, at least a sprinkle anyway. But you know, the greatest outpouring is coming at the end here. 
the mighty latter rain is coming at the end. Acts 14, 16, and 17, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. So again, never a time when God didn't have a witness upon earth. But we're looking for that mighty latter rain to come at the end that's going to bring everything to completeness. There are times in history when they had vintage years. Uh, they had revivals that changed the course of nations. Even like the Welch revival back in 1904. That revival lasted about five months and it changed the whole course of the nation. That little revival. It was birthed through a lot of pain and intercession, but it was short-lived, but that revival changed the whole course of a nation. I used to have a good friend years ago when I first came to Uriah, an older man. He was in the Second World War, and we used to go hunting together down in Warren, and we used to go different places. And he was telling me about a revival that they experienced in a little town outside of Warren, Youngsville. Maybe some of you know where that's at, Youngsville. And he was telling me about the graduating class, the high school graduation class. Um, a, this is probably back in the 30s, something like that. But he said everybody in the graduating class class, senior class of that high school, this is public school, were saved. There was only one student in the whole graduating class that was not saved. I said, well, how about, how did he react in a group with all Christian, you know, young people? Well, he kept quiet and behaved himself because he didn't want to lecture, but um, I think that's phenomenal, public school. Every student in that grade and that senior class was saved. They had a little revival there. But in the study of church history, you see generations of declension, church going down. And then suddenly the good seed takes root and church revives again. It was up and down, up and down. Church history reminds us a lot of the day of the judges where every man did that which was right in his own eyes and like some of the heroes in the days of the judges they were lauded as heroes and they did some bizarre things but God evaluates each generation different and God looks at some and they were perfect in their generation Perhaps if they'd have been taken out of that generation and put into another generation, they wouldn't have been perfect. But um, when you take a look at some of the reformers, some of the earlier laborers going back centuries, um, some of their doctrines or practices would never be acceptable today. And in fact, you wonder if some of them even made it to heaven. Um, people like Zwingli, you know, he persecuted people that didn't conform to his standard, his doctrine. And he was persecuting Christians that were actually better than he. Um, like the Anabaptists, they believed in water baptism by immersion. He didn't. And so because he had a position there in Switzerland, he would baptize people to death. These Christians, the Anabaptists, he would put them underwater and hold them there until they died. And, you know, the others, others did the same thing. I mean, they agreed at least to what was going on. Amos describes the best of his generation as being sharper than a thorn hedge. That was the best of them. How does that sound? Sharper than a thorn hedge the best of his generation. 
But going back to the Reformation, I mean, they came out of an oppressive regime and then they oppressed. Others um, that didn't agree with their doctrine, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, they were oppressive. Uh, they didn't get along with each other. Uh, they did agree on certain things where they were persecuting other Christians, but I mean, um, you'd almost be ashamed. And they were kind of heroes in their day. But do you see what we're saying here? These were workers in the vineyard of yesteryear. And many of them were flawed, contesting over their beliefs. And they were using the sword to hack each other to pieces, not only the physical sword, but the literal sword. It's like a little scene back in Samuel. Remember where some of Saul's valiant men got together against some of David's valiant men and they all hacked each other to pieces? The sword, a place called Helkath Hazurim, Helkath Hazurim. They were hacking each other to pieces with the sword. And that's what some of these people did. They were killing each other with the sword, spiritually and even physically. There was another fellow here, the, one of the Pilgrim Fathers, John Robertson, Robinson, going back to the 1600s. And he made this remark. This is 1600s, but he said... Uh, the Calvinists and the Lutherans have not moved on in God. Kind of interesting. It seems as though every generation just kind of stops. They plateau someplace. Camp. So these were workers in the vineyard. Some of them paid a great price. Uh, but that brings us to our original point. The final harvesters have to have it right. Amen? The final harvesters have to have it right. They're chosen. They've been purified. And they're preaching the everlasting gospel. Gospel without flaw. So many of these that were called previous periods of time, epochs, they were called... Um, they restored an element of truth, perhaps. But on the day of reckoning, many of them are not going to have first place. Are you following me here? Now, before I end this little message here, I want to summon up another occasion where many are called and few are chosen. And this concerns the marriage supper. Today's generation kind of has a, a flippant attitude towards probably the most auspicious event ever offered to mankind. I mean, when you really think about it and meditate upon the marriage supper, this is the most auspicious, the grandest celebration ever offered to mankind. I mean, to be caught up and to be a part of this banquet and to be a part of those who are going to return to earth, to be a part of the government. Um, but to the church world today, it is like, well, once you sign in, once you become a Christian, we're all going up to the marriage supper. Very flippant, loose attitude about what's coming here. Now, in Luke's version of the supper, in Luke 14, many are treating this, I mean, very flippantly. They have more important things to do. And you know what happens here. At the very end of it, the Lord says, none of these who are bidden are coming in. Go out and find those who are. Go out into the highways and byways and bring them in. Those who will. Of course, it has an inference to Israel, but 
you get the, what I'm saying here. Many are invited to this supper. Many are called to this supper. But when it comes down to it, few are chosen. Because that fits in there too. In Matthew twenty-two fourteen, referring to the marriage, it says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are invited to come, but in the end, few are chosen. I mean, actually, this is a burden of mine. I, I have great concern about this because every place you go and you listen to preachers on radio, television, and it's like everybody's going up. That's not the way it's going to be. The bride that you see in Revelation 19 has prepared herself. She has the right attire, the right garments. She's been uh, made righteous through the working of the Spirit. She has outworked righteousness, not the kind you receive at salvation, imputed kind. But something has been worked into her life. She has prepared herself, and that's why she is a part of the marriage supper. Parable of the ten virgins. My wife really likes that picture out there with the ten virgins. Um, Matthew 25. Infers that these virgins are all pure. They're all in the kingdom. They're all waiting for the supper, but only five get in. What does that tell you? Many are called, few are chosen. That's why we don't want to take this invitation lightly. Many are called. I heard somebody share a vision here. Actually, I think it was Pastor Bailey about the marriage supper. And he's, I don't know whether he had the vision or was sharing a vision that somebody had. Anyway. And he said that all of these tables in heaven and the chairs around these tables all had names carved into the chairs. Your name is there in the chair. But then he saw angels coming and removing those chairs and putting other chairs in their place with other names on them. Many are called. You with me here? Many are called, few are chosen. A lot of people who just think we're going to get there just by being saved don't end up at this supper. The invitation is broad. The terms are very exclusive. So there's preparation. Revelation 19.7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Preparation. There's been thought. Anticipation. 19.8, Revelation 19.8. To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Verse 9, And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And as you read it in Revelation 20, Blessed and holy is he that has a part of this occasion. And that applies... Of course, that's to those who have already gone on. But that applies to the living as well. They are, have been blessed and they're holy. If we're going to be a part of the marriage supper, it's not just a come-as-you-are party. So, the qualifications are the same. Um, there will be laborers there from other generations that will be present at the banquet. But, Still the same, many are called, few are chosen. And I'll tell you something, this is one occasion I don't want to miss. How about you? You want to be there? I want to be there. I want to be at this 
a sumptuous banquet. I want to hear the words well done. I want to, uh, by God's grace, be a part of the government that returns with Christ to reign upon earth. It's no small thing. I say this with all my heart. I mean, um, think it, live it, pray it. I want to be there. I want you to be there. And, you know, not necessarily losing your salvation by not making the marriage supper, but, you know, So the last, our workers have to have the true message. They have to be prepared, chosen. God saves the best for the last. And the last are actually honored first. And just one more point here, I'm just about done. But we want to have an air of humility about the whole thing too. As Jesus told his disciples in Matthew, sorry, Mark 9.25, if any desire to be first, he comes up last. So we want to have an air of humility about the whole thing. 